Nisio Eason's Monogatari series, and more specifically the Shaft adaptation of the series, has become a staple here on the That Kerbo channel. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I like it because it's pretty freaking good. It's funny, compelling, dramatic at times, and immersive all-in-one long-ass package that's beautifully written and presented in such a unique way that you can recognize it from just a colored screen and some text. It's still getting written material too. The translated final season box set is now available for purchase and goddamn, that's a lot of money. I don't know if I could afford that. No, I can't. I spent it all on Guilty Gear Strive. Hype game. Every part just radiates the creative excellence of the series to varying degrees. Varying degrees like Suki Monogatari, sorry Yotsugi, love you, but also varying degrees like Kizu Monogatari, which upon rewatch, has easily become one of my favorite animated parts in the main seasons of Monogatari. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's the best, but it is nothing short of stunning. The story itself is epic, fast-paced, and almost not Monogatari at parts. The visuals are striking with clean and sharp characters, with fantastically fluid animation and an environment design that's much more focused on material realism, and a 3D 2D blend than the rest of the series. It is not the first anime to do either of these things, but it does both of them incredibly well. The blending of characters and the world is impeccable, yet it still manages to be distinctly monogatari. Fitting into the series is something that's just a bit more extra than the other stories it tells. The visual flair, exaggerated and vast backgrounds that stretch for literal miles, and color flashes due to budgeting is something synonymous with Shaft and Monogatari as a whole. And despite the looks and clearly unique direction and actions of the story, it still has its moments of pause, a lot of them. And the characters we know are still the same old ones met in other parts of the series. Though not entirely. As the main season's chronological first, we get to see what I would describe to be an incredibly raw experience that gets everything rolling. Kizumonogatari contains heaps of character development with moments of growth, vulnerability, and genuine moments of pain and struggle that shape the characters into those seen in Bakemonogatari and beyond. Despite any of the action, the character dialogue in both moments of peace and action are still the core of the experience, and it maintains that signature mix of fun, perviness, wit, and character themes that people have come to love it for me included. Kizu Monogatari was released theatrically in three separate hour to an hour and a half long parts spanning the start of 2016 to the start of 2017. Part 1, Teketsuhen, released on January 8, 2016. Part 2, Neketsuhen, on August 19, 2016. And Part 3, Reiketsuhen, on January 6, 2017. Iron-Blooded, Hot-Blooded, and Cold-Blooded. The names were suggested by Nisio Eason himself, and come directly from the line in Kizu Monogatari, in which Kishot first introduces herself as the iron-blooded, hot-blooded, yet cold-blooded vampire. Despite being adapted from the second novel in the series, the first movie released after the first season of Owari Monogatari, which came out in October 2015, and the Koyomi Monogatari app launched and started airing episodes on January 10, 2016, just two days after Taketsuhan started premiering in Japanese theaters. Kizu Monogatari had been in progress for a while, so the parts that were released around it didn't influence its style. The more visually abstract settings and flashes that can only be assumed to evolve with the budget from Awari are nowhere to be found in Kizu. Despite being more photorealistic and stranger in places, Kizu Monogatari's backgrounds are ultimately pretty simple distortions and exaggerations of what's already out there in the world. There's nothing overly abstract like a classroom in a color-shifting void adorned with white panes throughout, or a wall of metronomes that slowly start to synchronize as a conversation goes on. And a majority of the scene flashes aren't as out there as later monogatari's. They're mostly just a centered subject on a colored background, maybe some text elsewhere, just with a more cinematic look this time. In part, that can be assumed to be the case because of the themes also evolving to be more abstract, but without much word of the process from Shaft themselves, I can hypothesize it to be, in other part, a remainder of the direction from when the project first started all the way back in 2011. The fancy lighting and more high-definition 3D stuff probably came as the Monogatari budget evolved too. Most of this is only my assumption, but I can back it up with some archaic evidence, baby! In this very brief teaser from 2011, the art style still resembles the Kizu Monogatari we got, meaning that the unique look was planned from the start. But the shading is much more traditional, and the color palette in some of the shots bears more resemblance to that of Bakemonogatari. Monogatari. Particularly this close-up shot of Adaragi here. 
The PV version of him shaking has pretty distinct motion lines, and it also has pretty weighted hard shading. It's not heavy enough to be considered heavy, but it is significant enough to be seen and pointed out. Compare that to the more focused and final version of the same shot. It's pretty brief, but there are no motion lines and zero shading besides a gradient coming from the left. Kizumonogatari in general doesn't rely on hard shading as heavily as the rest of the series. It's there in scenes with very particular lighting, but most of the time it relies on highlights, a lot of highlights, environmental lighting, and more subtle shading. The majority of the movies being flat colors allows for the characters to pop, and the action scenes to probably save on a lot of money because they're probably hell and a lot of money to shade. The PV also doesn't have the distinct pink-red tinge in the final product's lit scenes. It's more of this pinkish green that's very much like the last bit of Bakemonogatari. As I wasn't sure if I was right, I sampled the brightest bit of skin from the PV, the movie, and a similarly lit shot with a similar palette and lighting condition from Bakemonogatari, Subasa Cat Part 4 if you're wondering. And to my surprise, the hue, saturation, and brightness values line up much more with the final version of Kizumonogatari, but the shading, much more muted palette, and I guess composition of the shot is what led me to draw the conclusion that I did. Oh dude, keep it to yourself, it's all over the damn place. Ugh. Clearly, a lot changed between 2011 and 2016. Big time gap when it was initially slated for early 2012. The biggest disappointment is probably that Adaragi's head doesn't blow up, not in Taketsu at least. The weird release schedule caused easily the biggest gap between the animated release order and the novel release order. While I now lean towards speaking less like an authority and implore that you do as you please when it comes to consuming the series, it is heavily recommended by the community to watch according to novel order for the best experience. If you choose to watch by airing order, the rift in order that Kizumonogatari's release creates hurts the understanding of major moments in the series immensely. Speaking from personal experience, the amount of times the events of Spring Break, aka Kizumonogatari, were referenced with no understanding of those events caused confusion. Episode, a character whose first appearance and actions take place in Kizumonogatari, first comes back during the events of Nekomonogatari White as a minor recurring character. His reminiscent babbling made zero sense to me, and it wasn't a type of babbling that builds character suspense. It was just a type that comes from not really getting what he's going on about. Because I didn't. In the age of the internet with people who have too much time on their hands, like me, telling you the preferable way to watch and ingest the series, it doesn't come to be much of an issue. Even less if you consume it how you want, really. One thing to note is that because of licensing, for my American viewers at least, the only way to watch Kizumonogatari legally is through Amazon Video. However, I think I know you guys and you know me well enough to know that didn't stop either of us. I just wanted to cover my bases before going in-depth with the contents of the trilogy. I'll be referencing and comparing parts of the movies to the novel, since I own it, but not to the manga, since I don't own it. I'll be talking for a while, kind of rambly me, picking up on the individual ideas while following the sequence of events of the movie. Feel free to put the video on in the background or something. That'll help me not put as much effort into editing this marathon, so let's get to it. The first movie opens up with scene cards. The dates March 26 and April 7. Vampire, Tragedy, and Histoire. While the dates are simply a time frame for the events of the story, those three words, vampire, tragedy, and story, are part of a series of cards spread throughout this opening scene that create a tone of anticipation for the rest of the movie. A giant, naked tree pans down as an elevator rings out and out comes the man Koyomi Adadagi, in a fierce panic. Uncertain, anxious, and on edge, as seen by the rapidly switching shots and very close-up camera work, he makes his way up a seemingly endless stairwell and reaches a door. I promise not to nerd out over every piece of design past this first scene, but I think it's brilliantly done here. The endless stairs furthermore illustrate the feelings of intensity and uncertainty for Adadagi. It's a sensation of fuck, when is it gonna end with no progression in sight. The use of an industrial type vault door at the top of the stairwell is part of the pretty consistent industrial theme that the movies have, but the door in particular opens up really slowly. It gives off an understanding of the strain that Adadagi's panic and wandering put him through so far, weakened by his hike throughout the facility, and getting to the rooftop of wherever he is would lead to believe that he finally gets a break. <laughs> no. He makes it out to the rooftop and it's all bad signs. A bleak, clouded sky, the same naked tree from the first few seconds, and crows. Like, damn, a whole lot of crows. These fuckers, yeah, bad, bad omen. 
It's pretty common in media for crows to represent that some bad shit's about to happen. Their pack name is called a murder for Christ's sake, no bueno. The crows look on as Adadagi walks out, but come alert as the sun starts to shine. A slow to fast shot of Adadagi starting to catch fire comes to reveal that this man is not okay. In fact, I'd say that he's not even doing that good. An absolutely fantastic illustration of pain with every aspect that can be done, being done amazingly while being almost completely non-verbal. The character animation is frantic, tearing yet smooth as he dances around in burning agony. Far distant shots create a sense of noise, and how loud Adaragi is crying out and yelling. The shaky or blurry shots once again create uncertainty, but this time with a pinch of fearing for dear life and the noise knows when to cut out so the viewer can simply watch a burning shell of a man, meteor from the top of a tall building and lay there to become ash. Cette histoire de vampire finira mal. Elle finira quand tout le monde sera malheureux. I haven't taken French in a bit, so I'm a bit rusty, but that means this story of a vampire will end badly. It will end when everyone is unhappy. What this exactly means given the present context is unknown, and it doesn't come to be fully processed until, quite literally, the end of the story. But from the looks of things, it would create the expectation of glorious death by the end of it all, which is in part a bit of a false expectation. I may be reaching a bit, but I personally think it makes sense. The text is ripped, translated, and paraphrased directly from the prologue of the novel, much like the other cards in the series. But the insertion of this scene that's from just a slight bit further along was an anime-exclusive creative decision. It creates a hook that serves the same purpose as the prologue, but with more physical elements to create an air of anticipation for this scene and what transpires before and after the fact. Functionally and in execution, it serves a similar purpose to the Kizu Monogatari recap scene in the first episode of Bake Monogatari, which starts the same as the novel and the scene after this. Hanakawa oh, panty oh, shot. Oh, 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 the fuck up. If you want to talk about a hook, can't beat some good ol' Hanakawa. I could make the obvious, kind of tired joke about how this is the best possible plot hook, but in reality it's probably just what Nisio Eason wanted to see at the time. Perfect enough, the scene functions as both a litmus test for what people's tolerances are, and also as a point of comparison for the narrative similarities and differences in Kizu Monogatari and the rest of Monogatari. I covered in my April Fools video, How is Koyami Adaragi so popular? The topic of an unreliable narrator, but didn't go in depth about how it affected the story besides what's called the main character bias. The way that Adaragi tells the story is incomplete, exaggerated, and only his perspective, and he's pretty adamant about that last fact. Page 1, or er, 9 I guess? Ultimately, I can only observe the incident from my own perspective, so I will never be able to know what that chain of events truly meant to anyone else, or what it didn't mean. Asking them may allow me to come to some degree of understanding of the circumstances, but even then, there's no way for me to know if their words are true. It's an acknowledgement that this version of the story is not the whole truth, and that there are other sides to be told. As his own version though, it's what he knows. Shaft is able to get extra mileage out of the different angles of each monogatari in several ways, and for Kizu, it's SEX! The flip of the skirt by a sudden gust of wind is said to only have lasted for maybe a second, but it's described by Adaragi to have seemed like hours. Bake Monogatari, while still not objective in its narration, more realistically depicts the event in slow motion with a timer correlating to the real passage of time, while Kizu goes full bananas. Massive gust of wind, skirt literally inverted as the wind carries on for seconds upon seconds. Light shines into Adaragi's eyes since the sight was so dazzling. Both achieve the same purpose and last long enough to make the detailing start to put Adaragi's narrative sanity and attention to detail into question, but man, they could not be any more different. Seemingly embarrassed yet unaffected by the event, Tsubasa Hanakawa brushes herself off and makes humor out of the situation in the form of a computer safety PSA. If I was bigger, this is the point where I'd transition to a VPN sponsorship or something, but I'm not, so no VPN. It's a cute gesture, but Adaragi shrugs it off and leaves to do his own thing. But his attempt to leave is put to an end quickly and his attention is caught by the fact that Hanakawa knows his name, down to the characters used. Oh my god, this scene has no right to look this good. It's so fluid and pretty, god. The banter here is short, but it carries on to more small talk as Adaragi's knowledge of Hanakawa's name and her accomplishment catches her off guard. 
Adaragi claims his knowledge to be the case of her popularity, to which Hanakawa responds with a bash at humility and a stop that. What's cut here is Hanakawa mentioning that Adaragi is a popular name in school, to which he's obviously shocked and can only come up with the reason because he's a bad actor within the school. Their chat moves to vampires and the rumored sighting of one. A blindingly blonde woman with no shadow and a gaze striking enough to free someone in their tracks. It's a long and enthralling enough talk that Hanakawa questions how Adaragi doesn't have any friends, since he's so easy to talk to. And he bullshits the answer of, if I made friends, I'd become less human. It's an answer that's quickly made up, but it's also an answer that ironically stands firm for the whole main series. His reasoning shows self-pity, but also empathy for others. While he's smart enough to make it into a prestigious private school, Adaragi doesn't have too much social awareness, once again covered in my April Fool's video. He gets offered a trip to the library by Hanakawa, but since it's spring break and he just got out of school, he sees no reason in it. With disappointment in her eyes, Hanakawa snatches Adaragi's phone and puts her number into his contacts. He forcefully made a friend, and their sort of relationship at the start is one that'll propel his character out of his shell and into a bigger person. And that's the last talk before they part ways for the moment and Adaragi heads home. Once at home, he sits stationary in his room, hung up on the encounter he had. It eventually overwhelms him and he rushes over to the bookstore. For what? Porn. Porn featuring schoolgirls with black hair and braids. Even if you find Adaragi's actions and thoughts odd, it's so comically executed you can't really help but chuckle. The audio cues and visuals were hilarious. Why is he a seal? I, I don't know, but being a part of the flashes as he runs to buy an Arrow magazine just came off as unreasonably funny. The comedy is cut short by all the streetlights cutting out, all except for one, illuminating the entrance to a subway lined with a long streak of blood. Adaragi goes to investigate, and after his lengthy investigation, he finds her. A gaze as cold as ice, blonde hair with intensity matching the sun, and no shadow to be seen. Kiss shot, Ace Rolo Orion, Heart Under Blade, a vampire whose presence leaves Adaragi at a standstill. This scene here is just wonderful. The novel originally had Kiss Shot sat under the lone powered streetlight. It's a location that's fitting and sensical. However, the use of the large subway station lets the suspense play out and build up without any regard for realistic proportions of space. One odd thing is the question of how Kiss Shot's body wound up there, which is actually a piece of conversation that'll show up later. Quite a bit later. I think the deviation from the originally described location is a valid complaint and I even share the stance, but I also think it plays into the visual storytelling great. We get to see Adaragi get visibly more tense and worried as he continues to follow the trail of blood that seemingly goes on forever, and once he reaches the source, we can see that tenseness get mixed up with fear as he shambles towards Kishot's dismembered body. His movement is incredibly shaky, he's hyperventilating, his hands are quivering as he struggles to properly input the characters for an ambulance. The fear starts out as fear for Kishot's life, but her demand for his blood and the realization that she's a monster transforms the fear into that for Adaragi's own life. The rapid switching of the shots and the artificial blur and shake, the shot where he envisions running away but is bound by her gaze to the position he's standing at with the rising orchestration is fear incarnate. He manages to make his escape, but the powerful vampire kiss shot bursts into tears. Bloody tears, water tears, and her cries like that of a baby's echo throughout the location until they inevitably stop. Adaragi returns to the spot, but not before some reflection. Reflection I think was mostly omitted from the movie. He gives a little pep talk for her and has a few self-pitying parting words. But even though he doesn't want to go through with getting his blood sucked dry, it's described that he only did it because he sees his value in life as significantly less than hers. He sees himself as someone who has yet to achieve anything great, with no one to really care about him if he dies. To add salt to the wound, he can only conjure up the image of four people who would even notice that he'd gone missing. That being his family. It's a stance that's unfortunately very realistic. Adaragi is able to transform it into something seemingly noble here by sacrificing his meaningless life for a life he sees as worth more. But it's the actions he takes in the same vein that leads to problems further on. And it's the mentality of others before himself that we get to see change also further along. Seeing him start to show care and help himself. And hey, it's the thumbnail shot. It's a very pretty frame. The whole subway is very pretty, don't you think? Human. It was not a dream. 
Adoragi wakes up in the ruined cram school, except here, it's more of a pristine college of sorts. If there is one thing that Adoragi's feeling, it's confusion. His thought process trying to cope, not see, just cope with, and rationalize the circumstances that led to two whole days passing under his nose is what led to him bursting into flames at the start of the movie. He learned to stop, drop, and roll and attempted to utilize it, but it didn't work. The one time in his life he needed it and it did fuck all, I'd be pissed, but I'd also be on fire. This fragmentation and displacement of the sequence of events, in my opinion, fits the pacing of the story and how they're played out. Like I said when I talked about the first scene, isolating the middle and putting it dead at the start creates anticipation for the circumstances around the scene as a high intensity hook with zero actual context. I also believe that if it was to be one continuous scene, there would be less punch to a weakened kiss shot coming out and saving Adadagi, given that there's already a big punch in the form of Adadagi combusting into flames and all. So to separate the two lets both result in a goddamn reaction, or something along those lines. The newly recovered but weaker kiss shot takes her time explaining the current whatabouts, whereabouts, howabouts, whenabouts, the whole nine yards. This is about as monogatari as it gets. A combination of exposition and charming character dialogue with perpetually shifting backdrops that manages to stay enthralling despite it, you know, just being talking. Both Maya Sakamoto and Hiroshi Kamiya are fantastic voice actors, and the same can be said for the whole cast. It's their work that brings out the character in the dialogue and makes watching so engaging. This is a much cuter and funnier scene than the one that preceded it, and the kind of casual, human aspect of their master-servant relationship will be one that develops more as the story continues forward. Anuragi is tasked with collecting the missing parts of the broken kiss shot, in exchange for being turned back into a human. It's the offer he can't refuse, yet takes half reluctantly. But it comes with being aware of the challengers he needs to take on for his side of the bargain to be fulfilled. Dramaturgy, Episode, and Guillotine Cutter. Those are the names of the people Adaragi must fight for his humanity, and he better damn well remember it, because they could have easily been the last people he saw. Imagine if that did happen, in stark contrast to his sacrifice to Kishot, Adaragi would have died on others' terms, and the last thing he sees are those who are quite literally putting him down like a rabid dog. This is another area we can compare to both Bakemonogatari and the novel. It is originally depicted as a residential area, but here it's much more industry. Even if it does deviate from the source material substantially, it doesn't matter too much here. Kisha told Adaragi to walk down a street, it doesn't have to be a residential area. It's not as big of a difference as the subway scene, and it even adds a sense of epic to his inevitable ass beating. He tries to appeal to emotion by shouting out to his fellow humans in chat, but what Adaragi learns over the course of his quest is that the only person with a sliver of humanity amongst the four is him, so the words are meaningless in the end. He cowers in shock as his last and only option before a savior drops from the sky and puts an end to the commotion. <laughs> it never gets tiring to hear him say that. It's Meme Oshino. You know who he is. He's so cool. His his name? It's like meme. Like like you know internet memes? Like like the troll face. Bruh. You follow my TikTok? Oshino is a self-proclaimed free spirit and neutral party. I think both of those points are backed up in one action. He just kind of lays back and says whatever needs to be said. It's even better in the novel. He just sets up a bunch of stray tables to form a bed and then proceeds to lay down for the rest of the entire conversation. It doesn't happen here since the abandoned classroom is interpreted as a lecture hall with static desks, but his posture is still enough to get his lax attitude across. I'd call him a chronic smoker too, but as you know at this point, he doesn't ever light the damn thing. It's explained later in the novel that he doesn't do it because it'd be hard to animate. Just one of the multiple fourth wall breaks that Monogatari's got. Kizu especially has quite a few. He discusses the game plan with Kishot and Adaragi. To form a balance in fighting power, since that's his main job, he'll get the three hunters to split up while it's up to Adaragi to recover Kishot's parts through battle. He's gotta do the hard work himself. And that wraps up Taketsuhen, the first of the three Kizu Monogatari movies. The cliffhanger it's left on certainly got me hyped up for the fights to come, especially considering how Adaragi took to the 3v1 the first time around. Surely a collection of 1v1 fights will serve him better. There was certainly some stuff missing from the novels, yeah, extended dialogues and Adaragi's internal monologues, 
but it ultimately still gets the main point across and sets things up just the same. A light novel doesn't have the restrictions in terms of keeping flow as a movie does, so while the details left out add more character, the impressions left overall are about the same. Taketsu is just pure introduction, so I couldn't do too much analysis, just kind of say hey this will happen and admire the views while attempting to give insight on why I think they look good. For just a collection of story setup scenes, they're paced surprisingly well. About 4 or 5 events spread across 1 hour including credits. It adopted about 100 pages and it ended at the start of chapter 7. That's where Niketsu picks up from. Dramaturgy the first of the vampire hunters that Adaragi has to take on in order to restore Kishot and return to being a human. For a first battle, it looks pretty grim all things considered. The guy's a full vampire, he's 7 foot and incredibly fucking jacked, and it's raining. It's gonna get his fit soaked. Nobody wants that, right? It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and vampires killing each other is just the natural order of things, as Kishot describes the cycle similar to every other species that kills each other and others for survival. Love nature. Adaragi had to prepare for the battle, as he's not been the type of guy to have been in fights before, and he turns to none other than vampire fighting for dummies, including techniques such as keeping your man up while he breakdances and how to deal with a friend that's on a different field of gravity. In comes Hanakawa on a random spur of the moment really late at night walk. Perfect timing. Her presence seems to have caused Adaragi's brain to lag a bit. I think her boobs might act as a signal blocker for brainwaves or something, Adaragi might have the 5G or something. Hanakawa starts the conversation kind of flirty, panty talk and all, and even playing into other parts of Adaragi she sees as sort of pervy, but Adaragi never responds to it directly. He's both too embarrassed to admit that he snuck a peek, and more concerned with the fight that he's about to have with a very tall and very muscular vampire, but their small talk continues on as Hanakawa insists that they keep chatting. Her quick wittedness and versatile book smart shocks and even flusters Adaragi just a little bit. Uh, it's really hard to put into words how much I love this quote. It really represents Hanakawa's character, and on its own, it's discreet enough and disconnected from any direct anime references that I'll probably be using it as my yearbook quote. I'll post proof in a year if I do, just, just watch. There are actually a lot of quotes in the series that can be considered discreet enough to be used as a normal yearbook quote, but that's besides the point. Hanakawa's astuteness and ability to banter easily with Araragi becomes a concern to him, it's getting late and the battle is soon. He's also concerned about Hanakawa being at the wrong place at the wrong time and getting wrangled up in the whole debacle. The way he attempts to dissuade her from staying around is incredibly crude, impulsive, and not the smartest play he could have gone with. <laughs> Hanakawa's optimistic reply was something that he did not want to hear, getting visibly angry at the response. It makes sense, honestly. Hanaka was showing great interest and optimism towards something that has only caused Adaragi pain so far. Her view of the things are far too unrealistic right after she outright denies the existence of them. Creatures of the night who suck blood and kill each other like animals, of course, just have a little chat. Ethics, morality, probably don't exist for them, it's just nature. Distinct nature from that of humans. I can assume it's that blissful ignorance that pushes Adaragi straight over the edge. He goes personal. <laughs> It's a show of negative character, and it's a harsh way to start a recess back into the anti-social shell he started out in. That was really hard to say, God. He keeps pushing her away from the insistence that they aren't friends, never were. He plays off thoughts he had when he first met her, she's just using him, it's just to look good. A bunch of rushing thoughts in the heat of the moment. The final straw here is Adaragi deleting the only contact he had on his phone and telling her to get lost. It's painful, genuinely agonizing for everyone. Adaragi is hesitant but he has to make his point. The viewer can see that and Hanakawa is clearly affected by the act. It's like the short distance between the two socially had been turned into miles upon miles of distance in an instant, as represented here beautifully. Hanakawa appears to take it in stride, but as she makes her leave, she's overcome with emotions and is barely able to make it away without bursting into tears. She clearly wanted to say something, but couldn't. That's her biggest character weakness, being unable to speak up and stand her ground. It doesn't mean much for Kizumonogatari, but her character arc is built around that core issue. Was it good for Adaragi though? Making friends only decreases his strength as a human. 
He'd have to be concerned for them, he'd have to care for them, and their moments of joy and bliss would only make him envious and angry at those people. That's what we saw here. With the burden of his soul friend gone, he can finally feel full as a human again. He wants to be human again. He felt approval when Oshino addressed him as such, so there's a clear clash in his personality and his physicality, his human mind and his vampire body. By rejecting Hanakawa, he's rejecting his vampirism and fighting himself to keep what he deems to be his humanity. The monologue conflict he deals with in the novel greatly assists in understanding the internal struggle that Aragi went through to protect Hanakawa, but he also reflects on his actions thus far. Does he really want to be human if it means something like that to him? Was the pain in his heart really worth it? Well, whatever his decision on the matter is, he can only go so far in his quest as a human. He needs the strength of a vampire in order to make it through his ordeal in one piece. In a feeble attempt to fight dramaturgy with human martial arts, he realizes quickly that he's outmatched and attempts to make a run for it but doesn't make it far. The real question here is how he's going to pay for all that property damage that's easily a few thousand for the windows. A fair bit of the motion in the fight is anime original due to the added environments, and it's an incredibly valid complaint here for novel readers since it's directly described to have never take place in the building, and it's explained why, security. Ignoring that though, since it's never mentioned in the movie, it's choreographed and animated so nicely that I can personally brush it off enough to enjoy even with the knowledge that it's not meant to be like that. And plus, people who only watch the movie wouldn't know, which was me before reading for the video. Adaragi finally comes to recognize his vampiric abilities, recovering his lost limbs in a matter of seconds. But he still makes one last ditch effort to practice the skills he graced through in the manual meant for human to human combat. It, it didn't work. He takes advantage of his passive abilities by once again recovering his limbs, but he also puts a quick end to the battle by taking advantage of his active skill of super vampire strength. He launches a heavy shot football straight at Dramaturgy's face like it's a baseball. It's this strength that allows Adaragi to hold immense leverage over his opponent and cause him to surrender. For a vampire that's 7 foot and incredibly muscular that could probably beat my weak little cousins in an arm wrestle, he takes the defeat honorably, probably because there's a giant thing ready to crush him, but you know. The entire class shows respect from one side to the other. Dramaturgy recognizes and respects Adaragi's power as higher than his starting and ending their encounter by requesting he join his group, claiming he'd be number one in no time. Adaragi obviously declines. He's not gonna become human by joining a legion of vampires. No bystanders came in the way of the battle. It was a fair duel with respectable terms laid out and fulfilled upon, and it caused no uproar from either side. He's a pure vampire, but Dramaturgy is a man with a code and a smart enough mind to know when to not mess with his opponent. For Adaragi, the terms of each fight and the lines of which not to cross are only going to get worse and blurrier from that point. Hanakawa emerges from hiding, watching the scuffle the whole time, and she's ready to make amends. What is built up here to be another serious rejection scene is stopped dead in its tracks by a quick-witted and overall entertaining character interaction stemming from the dramatic scene that just occurred earlier. He goes for the weak spot, but this time it's another weak spot. <laughs> And you know what, to her credit, she does. He's at a complete loss, and I mean, I would be too. Hanakawa asks him if she should continue flipping up her undergarments, but his actions after this are nothing but sincere and lacking in a motive besides guilt. He doesn't say to keep going. Instead, he bows his head, apologizes, and asks Hanakawa, Strong characters, the both of them. Adaragi is able to recognize the weakness in his human philosophy and admit that he did Hanakawa and her intentions wrong, while Hanakawa herself was able to see past Adaragi's outburst and understand it was a method of protection and forgive and forget, and she's even able to drill his true feelings out of him with persistence alone. She's damn smart, and she's able to take nearly everything with a mature face. The relationship may initially have been started and be built on a foundation of sexuality when Google exists, but it quickly becomes one built on trust, character, and an understanding of each other's weaknesses and strengths. I never got why the bag's a photograph of a Madison Square Garden bag. It's just described as a normal Boston bag, which I guess is the term for those types of small duffel handbags. The Madison Square Garden variety doesn't have any reason behind it, maybe I didn't read the right interviews. I can assume it's vintage, since the only place it's being peddled on is Japanese auction sites. Maybe it's some shaft in-joke I don't really get. Oshino hands the prize leg to an impatient kiss shot who proceeds to consume it in an overly cartoonish manner, just all in. I'd better watch myself. 
Originally, it's described vaguely, but implied to be so gruesome that it would stop any anime adaptation from happening. It, it happened. Kishot's new and slightly more powerful form is, if I'm allowed to say this, adorable, but it doesn't last for long. Before and after the reveal, Araragi cast doubt on Kishot's promise to make him human again. Oshino tells him to just put faith in the little vampire, and leads him to ponder on the thought of why he encountered a vampire in the first place. I have a lot to say and hypothesize on the exact reasons, every oddity that appears has a reason, but I think I'll get to that later. Hanakawa meets up at the cram school, the first time there's been an arranged meeting with the two, with the change of clothes and the eyes of someone who's always ready to assist. It's insightful to Adaragi's thinking, a very fun scene to watch overall, and a nice moment of pause between the serious vampire talk, but this scene brings to the table, primarily, sexual tension. Don't worry, it's not Twilight. Be it Hanakawa delicately touching Araragi's super toned and muscular body, or getting panicked when he does anything, the tension that grows between them, in my opinion, does set up the expectation for them to be a thing. But as it's seen in Bakemonogatari and beyond, Araragi ended up on a path radically different from expectations, since Senjugahara is just too goddamn good. In Kabuki Monogatari, the Oshino from the ruined world is bewildered by the fact that Araragi ended up with Senjugahara even going so far as to ask in his letter of desperation whom he ended up with in the main timeline, unknowing to the fact that it's a static variable throughout all of the known timelines. As seen in Bakemonogatari, Hachikuji too is surprised by the conclusion of Araragi's journey in partnership. Hanakawa discovers Araragi's lewd magazines brought in by Kishot, puts all the pieces together, and climaxes the build-up with nothing but a simple <laughs> episode. A half-human, half-vampire who hates both parties because he's chastised from both sides for bearing traits of both, but he hates vampires more. From that, I can infer that he might be a little racist. Alright, maybe a bit more than a little bit racist. A lot racist, even. Episode's demeanor and method of attacking draw a stark contrast between him and Dramaturgy. While Dramaturgy went into duel in an honorable, professional manner, with Adragi throwing things to end the fight, Episode's tactics fueled by bloodlust and vampire racism lead him to flip the tables and to attempt on circling in on an easy kill, chucking his giant cross everywhere while the sound of his menacing yet condescending laugh echoes throughout the battle. Weirdest bit in the scene to me was the light shining on the cross as it was lodged in the ground as Jesus on the cross flashes. I don't think that's what Jesus would do. Being a blood-sucking vampire who buys dirty magazines because they saw a cute girl is pretty unchristlike if you ask me. It's one of the more normal uses of Jesus in anime, just as a point of symbolism, but it stuck out pretty heavily to me. Oh look, it's Hanakawa! Yeah. Huh, look, she's dead. She was trying to give advice in order to help Adaragi counter Episode's main source of leverage, which is missed. But as you can see here, she got gored pretty hard in the abdomen by Episode's giant, very, very heavy cross. It was a direct attack, about as intentional as intentional can get. Despite being half-human, Episode's inhumanity was able to shine through and cause Araragi to go absolutely ballistic. The rage that Araragi felt seeing Hanakawa's guts get flung out of her body with a torrent of blood stretched beyond what a human could ever follow up with. More specifically, beyond what a human like the friends or weakness Araragi would ever be able to muster. The weakness is just gushing out here. If she felt pain, he'd feel pain. If she died on a spot, he'd kill a man on the spot in a way only a vampire could. As the dust begins to settle, Episode's mist powers get disabled and Araragi goes in for the kill. Stained. Brutality. Pain. Murder. A rush of emotions that would've left a man dead if there wasn't a mediator. Before their match started, Episode stated that he loves bullying the bad guys, and calls Araragi a monster. At the start it makes sense, Araragi's a full vampire and the kin of the most powerful vampire out there. There is a murky, yet clear enough area that defines Araragi as the monster here, and thus, a man that needs to be taken care of. As their battle progresses though, the more and more the lines are drawn, and the more that clear line starts to muddy. Episode put his weapon through a person that wasn't his opponent and laughed it off. But does that justify Araragi attempting to kill him as a quick form of justice and revenge? While I'm on the side of Araragi here, it is a bit of a long shot to give him full points here. They were both men with missions, first and foremost. Episode deviated from the path of defeating his one target just a bit, while Araragi was willing to forego his goal entirely in order to exact vengeance in the spur of the moment. As a vampire with sick nasty powers, he completely disregarded his own goals of receiving the other leg from Episode, and fought a battle for his one and only friend. 
When Oshino stopped him, he was told to stop, otherwise he'd lose his humanity. What does that really mean at this point? His intensity of a human is nearly gone, he's less of a human, and the only thing keeping him human is the self-interest that comes in saving himself. The comment Oshino made was enough to stop him, which shows that he still has a desire to be human, a desire big enough to stop his actions from being carried out, and a desire big enough to set him back when he realizes that he almost killed a man. Is Aradagi a monster? Only a monster can do what he was able to do and pour blood onto Hanakawa's wounds and have them magically heal. So even if he is, maybe being a monster isn't all that bad? A question to be followed up on later. Hanakawa comes to and makes a little remark that would normally make Araragi react a bit more, but the relief that comes with her being alive is far more valuable than anything sexual. This scene is emotional, the score is a very minimal piano, and a little bit of violin or whatever string it is. And their dialogue here highlights their dynamic that's more than just panty shots and caressing some abs. Even if it doesn't branch off into anything more, it's an authentic friendship that I think most people would die to have if they don't. I don't know if I'm allowed to show this on YouTube, I think that's a naked girl, so I'm just gonna nod, but damn! Stage 3 kiss shot is a beauty, love the outfit, killing it. Anuragi and Hanakawa meet up for hopefully the last time before the final encounter over a couple of cokes. I'll drink to that. Anuragi is able to finally clear his consciousness of their first pre-battle meeting and tell Hanakawa with an honest and straightforward face to go home. They reflect on the events that have unfolded so far, and Adagi gives a heartfelt confession to his friend that her pain was equally as much his pain, a confession that her struggles means much more to him than it probably does to her. His defined perception of friendship isn't wrong to him, but the worries he puts both himself and others over don't reflect the same in those he chooses to struggle for. The time Hanakawa has spent isn't seen by her to be a waste, but rather as fun, since it's spent with Adagi, a friend. God, I can't help myself from gushing over their chemistry. Hanakawa plays such a huge role in Araragi's development and growth as a character, going above and beyond to help the man out even if it means putting her own life at risk. It's what Araragi's been doing as well, but Hanakawa lacks the vampire skills to do what he's been doing. As a friend though, the little bits of effort that Hanakawa's put in really do mean a lot considering the stakes. I think this interaction is really important for character development and also as a general message. Compare the substance of their dialogue to the first interaction Araragi has with Kishot. He originally valued his life so little that he's willing to throw it away for a monster, but now he's here. He places value on himself for Hanakawa, his friend. There will always be at least one person who cares, it's just a matter of who. Araragi got lucky running into Hanakawa, but given how the Monogatari series works, it may be more than just luck. Hanakawa gives Araragi a keepsake, and a memorable one at that. She tries getting Araragi to promise to give it back, but nah. It's sort of symbolic, their friendship opened up with a panty shot, and now they cemented their place with some panties as a token. In place of returning her panties, Araragi promises to repay Hanakawa for the things she's done for him so far, and beyond. And he's gonna have to live up to it soon enough. Marui, missed. Guillotine Cutter, a man driven by his faith, a faith fueled by the existence of oddities, and it's his destiny to slay. The odds are incredibly stacked up against Araragi here. Hanakawa is a hostage in a situation out of Oshino's mediator control. While he hasn't flung any guts, Guillotine Cutter's usage of Hanakawa on the battlefield is purposeful and infinitely more sinister than the likes of Episode. As far as it's been seen here, it's an inverse line chart of each opponent's humanity and their humanity. The only one with no trace of vampirism, the pure-blooded human, using underhanded tactics, violent yet quaint emotional and physical manipulation by forcefully taking a close friend by the neck, in a manner that can only be described as cold and calculated malevolence. Episode called out Araragi as being good to kill because he's a vampire, a monster. But much like his opponents, Araragi is also on an inverse line chart, spotting out that with each bit of humanity he loses as he slowly takes on more with his vampiric powers, the more human he becomes. It's true that his body is that of a vampire, a monster, but his conviction, sense of justice, and willingness to grow is that of a man. He gives up his humanity in order to carry out one major act of heroism, but not in a way seen by heroes, but villains. 
in one of the most intense minutes of the movie. The harsh winds, guillotine cutter laughing menacingly as Aragi burst out in anger at the idea of not seeing Hanakawa again, as his arms turn into plants. An intense scene of rushing down the street in a fit of adrenaline, being both him literally rushing to the site of the battle in a non-sequential order, but it also illustrates the rush of him transforming in an attempt to save his friend. That paired with the surprisingly awesome drum and bass track of all things, it's really cool. He saves Hanakawa and props Guillotine Cutter up on a cross, another one of those helicopter shots to show the scale of Araragi's wreckage. That cross is kind of ironic, isn't it? And that's where Niketsu ends, with no humanity left, but conviction left intact. Maybe being a vampire isn't so bad after all. Compared to Taketsu, this part left out a lot from the novel, too much to even cover. Taketsu only left out maybe a few pages worth of stuff, but Niketsu left out what I would call chapters worth of information. The main meat is watching Aragi develop and change as a character and vampire, which I think was done pretty good. It ultimately is a close enough experience, but the vampire hunters get much more time in the spotlight when put into text. Dramaturgy in particular got hit pretty hard. The whole thing about his group was novel only, so if you only watched the movie, you didn't miss that, I had to add it myself. I thought it was interesting, and it comes back around much later in the series, beyond Zoku Owari Monogatari even. It also humanized Episode a bit more, having him show some amount of grievances for his actions as just being done in the heat of the moment. The adaptation of this part also left out quite a bit of Hanakawa interaction, which was kinda sad for me. I love all the characters in the series, but re-watching and reading really let her grow on me, more than she already has, and I'm surprised how much it's done for a character I already liked quite a bit. I can understand the cut content for pacing reasons, and to focus more on the fights and Araragi, but it leaves a bit of a bad taste on my tongue to not recommend reading the novel if you haven't, but of course, that's up to you. Most of the development left out is pretty self-contained as far as the main seasons go, and you should only read it if you really want that information, or if you want to read the source as you please, of course. Niketsu covers about 120 pages from the novel and leaves off at chapter 14, which is where Reiketsu, the final part, picks up from. Kiss Shot Isurola Orion Heart Under Blade is finally restored back to her fullest form. The arms were a part of it, but Oshino carried a secret on him unbeknownst to either Adaragi or Kishot herself. The heart. That one's pretty important, the organ that gets the blood flowing, taken from under Kishot's nose and kept around until the final moments. As a keeper of balance, it's only natural that an outpowered 3v1 would need to be nerfed in some regard. Everything from that fight and beyond, as described by Oshino, was a collection of lucky streaks. I don't believe it, given how oddities work, but since this is from the perspective of Araragi, for things I want to know, there will always be things that I don't get to know. Oshino never says a proper goodbye or farewell, but some of his parting words are vague, yet packed with a sense of looming horror given previous conversations. It's menacing, and it's a line that'll challenge Adaragi's integrity as a human, if that really means anything. Kishot and Adaragi talk about her days past, and her first servant, the guy with the name I can't really pronounce. God, when I made that guide video, it was really hard saying. Seishiro Shishiri. It's not awfully hard if I sound it out slow and all, but recording puts me in a different atmosphere, it's harder then. Primarily, it's just a way for Kishot to show off Kokoro Atari, the apparition slayer forged by the first minion that cuts Adaragi clean in half but heals him right up. But it's also to show how Adaragi's acting with Kishot, still somewhat unaware of his full vampire attributes. Interesting stories being told as the night passes by, there's a level of comfort and kinship between the two. One last bit of enjoyment before the two go on their own ways. Feeling hungry as Oshino said he would, Kishot feeling the same as well, Adaragi goes to fetch some food from a store, leaving with an omen that leaves a similar note as Oshino's parting remark. With a skip in his step, replaying memories of the good times had, Adaragi returns to Kishot with food in hand. It reincorporates shots from the first scene in Taketsu, probably to show the distinct shift in mood and ideology that Adaragi has picked up over the course of the story. <sighs> 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 
Ah, I see. He made the mistake of getting human food instead of getting human food. Common mistake, everyone does that when they first start out. Guillotine Cutter, a man driven by his faith, devoured in pursuit of his faith-bound destiny. That would make him a martyr, wouldn't it? What a way to go out, and a bold one as well. And like that, any goodwill regarding the presumed morality and ethics of vampires have vanished in a flash. Blinded by unknowing ignorance and a personal bias that subtly developed, Adagi failed to realize that being a vampire is, in fact, very bad and they are a menace to society. What vampirism has meant to him and what it's represented so far is meaningless in the grand scheme. They're monsters. The perspective that he's had as he's been helping Kishot was skewed from the very start, and he comes to realize that the vampire hunters, you see, they hunt for a pretty good reason. Adaragi's continued selflessness here has bit him in the ass immensely. He throws himself in a fit of rage, regret, hysteria, even hallucinating one of the most bizarre, bloodlusty scenes in the trilogy after coming to realize what the hell he's done. His only solution? Die. Paralleling his first sacrifice, Adaragi deems the life of others to be more valuable than his own worthless life, so the pain he feels in the case of his own going to waste is outweighed tenfold by the pain that the others would have to go through. The thing that stops him in this case is his friend. Hanakawa crossed his mind when first giving his life to a greater cause, but this time around they actually speak, and it's Hanakawa that puts the stop to his potential actions. Her words, her cadence, her odd scene with her running kinda naked through latex but there aren't any nipples so it's okay. That's somebody's fetish. Yeah. It's almost angelic, and that's been Adagi's perception of Hanakawa the whole time. And you know what happens when a horny teenage boy sees an angel with big boobies right in front of him? Heh, <laughs> show me your tits. Okay, it's not wholly like that, but the offer is as left field as talking to a close personal friend comes. It's even more left field when she says, yeah, anything to help I guess. Adaragi's a dog chasing a voluptuous mail truck and he caught it within 10 seconds after starting. It's such an awkward scene with a whole lot of tension in the air. He keeps teasing and talking, it makes you wonder, will he do it? Will he do it? Will he violate the sexual integrity of his one and only friend? Nah, he won't. The relationship and Adaragi's whole narration scheme is partially built on sexual humor, libido, not sexual activity however. He gets opportunities from Hanakawa herself to engage in more risque acts as seen in Nisei Monogatari, but their relationship is precious and engaging further means it being severed just for some boobies. No touching the merchandise. For Adaragi, being openly touchy is best left for his sisters, and also dead girls. In the context of this scene though, Hanakawa is visually frustrated that Adaragi doesn't proceed further, but Adaragi promises to finish his compromise massage once they return to school. He can't lose now. Both repaying his debt to Hanakawa and giving her an extended shoulder rub are now his reasons to live on to the next day. Two more than he had before. And so, the final fight begins. Kiss shot Acerola Orion heart under blade. The iron-blooded, hot-blooded, yet cold-blooded oddity slayer who's lived for 500 years and feasts off the flesh and bone of humans. Adadagi's last challenger, his master, a challenger of equal power whom he fights not only for his humanity, but for the sake of humanity as a whole. I'm gonna take the mostly action of the fight scene to finally wrap up my thoughts on what the story kinda meant. The scene itself is gorgeous and animated way better than it ever needed to be. The effects are impeccable, the shot composition and deep orchestral music score gives the fight a dramatic accent, the character animation itself is cleaner than… I don't know, something that's clean, yet the rough sketch appearance in some areas gives the action incredible amounts of oomph. The fight is choreographed to a T, a mix of high octane and even humor on occasion, and the gore is plentiful considering what the stakes of the battle are. Some of this I'm not even sure I can show on video. Not for monetization, I don't care and I don't have it, but it's hard to indicate if Adaragi's torso splitting in half due to twist, or him missling through Kishot's chest right into the goods like a blazing torpedo, will be allowed to be even shown here. But I've reviewed both modern Doom games, so it's probably fine. Kizu Monogatari has a lot of themes and ideas it delivers, but in the end, it's a very simple main idea that means a lot to Adaragi's character. I can dig into it all I want, but I see it first and foremost as a story with characters, not just delivery vehicles for moral ideas. If you disagree with the ideas I'm about to say here, feel free to talk about it in the comments. 
I'd love to see what you think of it. I may have even missed something about my main point. The differing perspectives of the story mean different things, and some of it may be unaccounted for. I do intend to come back to some of the longer stretching ideas when they come back around, but for Aragi's tale and the meaning of his encounters in his story, it all stems from one place. Why did Kishot even appear to Adadagi? It's because Hanakawa told him about the idea of a vampire, clearly, but it's also because of Hanakawa. Let me explain. Hanakawa is the springboard for the events of Kizumonogatari. At what specific point is unknown, but her encounter with Adadagi stays lingering for a while after it happens. And that's where it gets him. Oddities can appear for a few reasons. Some of them are as simple as just speculation and rumors with deep belief, which is the baseline for oddity spawning, see Nautico Snake, some are long legacies that come from the older hotshot oddity specialist, see Suriga Monkey, Skihi Phoenix, and Yotsuki Doll, and others that are both belief, but they also come as a manifestation of a shift in mental state, typically as a reflection or response to a negative action, see Subasa Cat, Tiger, Hitagi Crab, Mayoi Snail, and Kishot Isarola Ryan Heart Under Blade. Kishot is a long live legacy, yes, and can fit into all the categories I described, but the reason why she showed up to Adaragi out of everyone, and why she made him into a minion of all people, is because his mental changed when he heard the rumor and met Hanakawa, a sign that her presence is becoming more of a notable thing to him. I can excuse the subway being an unorthodox location because the area she spawns in is irrelevant to the idea. Hanakawa is the first friend Adaragi makes in the third year, and as he said at the beginning here, if I made friends, I'd become less human. If it was a passive encounter that didn't continue to linger on into the day, the events that transpired would have never happened. Adaragi would have never gone to the bookstore to buy Hot Sexy Women Girls in Uniforms Volume 7 out of 27, and the rumored kiss shot would have never appeared both because he wouldn't have gone out in the first place, but also because he'd never heard of her prior to that. One small detail like that has lasting effects. The best example I can give of this is how the absence of Ghost Hachikuji in Kabuki Monogatari's altered timeline leads the world to become a shell. Not because of any major alterations happening, everything else ended up the same, except the seemingly minute detail of Hachikuji not being there in Shinobu's absence, a note that saves Aragi's life against Hanakawa Black. It's been a bit of a theme running in this video that yes, Adaragi becoming a vampire is almost directly correlated to his relationship with Hanakawa, and similarly, the scaling of his vampirism is representative of his growth as a person, growing a sense of empathy and actions for others. As he went further along, the less it became about regaining his humanity, and the more it became about getting justice for Hanakawa, as the more battles were had, the more she got tangled up in it all. In that, Adragi failed to see the bigger picture, and a bias formed by spending time with a harmless, weaker version of Kishot that didn't let him realize that he was fueling a fire, that would only end up on the path to consume the very thing he grew to fight for, and the very person he swore to live for. What he was doing was noble, but his failed understanding with good intent prevented him from stopping a brewing pot brimming with trouble. It's not a tale of the dangers of helping others, I don't think Nisio wants you to punch homeless people in case they're monsters or whatever. It's a tale of balance, and a tale of grey morals. The end of Kizumonogatari is a painful one, in a sense of challenging morals. With the threat of Kishot almost entirely eliminated, Oshino gives Adaragi a choice after he begs. Kill her and save the world, or let her live, still having a risk being posed, but she will remain as a shell, functioning as nothing but a reminder. A living corpse of what was once a regal and elegant beast. Kishot eggs Adaragi onto kill her, it was her intent. It will save anyone else the pain of what Adaragi saw when he walked into the classroom. But here, the story will only end once everyone is unhappy. Adaragi didn't do anything bad, from his perspective at least. Him turning on Kishot doesn't make him a hypocrite as she says he is. He only saw the reality of the situation far too late. He was just doing what the right task was for himself, but then it escalated into something for his friend. It would take a lot of heart for him to kill the one that he was bunking with for the past two weeks, even if it is for a greater good. So, he didn't. For the first time in this whole story, Adaragi did something wholly and entirely for himself. Adaragi, now a human enough vampire, and that girl, a vampire enough husk, a reminder of his imbalanced ideas of justice. Kishot Acerolo Orion Heart Under Blade's final confrontation was the consequence of Adaragi's vampirism reaching its maximum, representing his ideas of generosity and selflessness coming back around to kill him. 
as he was either blissfully unaware or averting his gaze to the consequences of helping a monster. The solution Adoragi went with shows a balance in his humanity, and his inhumanity. His humanity is one fueled by self-interest. Other people mean weakness, and his inhuman part in the balance is just that. The shell of a vampire remains there to remind Adoragi of the consequences of an overambitious sense of selflessness, but she is also there as a memento of the good that came with its intensity lowered as well. Hanakawa, his only friend, is the only one who knows what exactly happened during spring break. Adoragi found his own self-worth in others, and kept himself alive only for the sake of his friend. To erase all reminders of that would be the same as him trashing Hanakawa's number, abandoning that progress and giving a big fuck you to the time. If you die tomorrow, my life ends tomorrow too. If you live today, I can survive the present too. As the series continues forward, the more their codependency becomes camaraderie built off of something more than love, but a relationship forged in blood. That girl, the shell, is a scar of a story unspoken. He may have not been able to regain his humanity, but the weight of the story means a lot, and it is a weight that he is willing to carry for his own sake, as a reminder. Kizumonogatari is a story about the growth of a man, and the scars left from his ideas. It strays a bit from the novel, leaves a lot out, but overall it's still a great experience to watch from start to finish, and is still written really well and it flows great. It has a good balance of conversation and action, and also a balance of humor and seriousness. The movies manage to pull off environment and tone so goddamn well, and I can go on for a long ass time about how much I love the character animation in this. It takes advantage of the medium to the highest degree. I found it hard to really get my ideas and continuous theme analysis across, not because I think the themes are super abstract here, but because this is the first time I tried to do something this long. I hope my main ideas came across okay. It wasn't too convoluted words-wise, and I hope to god it was entertaining enough. The ideas that Kizumonogatari sets up for Adaragi's character and the people he meets carry on through the whole story, and I think that's awesome. And as a Monogatari part, as always, it's impeccable. What's up guys, it's 1am Kerbo here. I'm gonna keep this outro brief, but it's one hour long. Who fucking gives a shit? Like, that took a bit of time, but I did want to get this out as fast as I can, but I wanted to put the most effort I can, considering that, you know, there was a two month gap between a pretty mediocre Friday Night Funkin' video and this one. So I hope the wait was worth it, if you are waiting, we're waiting. And you know what? You guys are great. <laughs> I don't know you guys, but, but, but you're great. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Join the Discord. As always, you can follow me on Twitter too. It's worse than my community tab somehow. And subscribe if you really liked it or something. I don't know. As always, happy camping, friends.